Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be looking at William Blake and the Songs of Experience, establishing some background information and historical context for some of the poems that we'll be reading in our next class, or at least discussing in our next class. First of all, Blake was writing primarily during the uh, Georgian England period, or the Georgian period in England. Although his life and his works continued on after this period concluded in 1789, he produced some of the most famous works in what are known as his Songs of Innocence and his Songs of Experience, including a number of the poems that you had to read for our synchronous class this week during this era. So understanding something about the socio-political and historical context in which he is working will help us to appreciate the way in which he is approaching the subjects in his, let's say, his grand opus, his masterworks, these compared series of poems, the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience. Georgian England is a period in English history that really focuses on the reign of three monarchs, George I, II, and III. Now, what's important to note about this period is that after Queen Anne, the prior ruler, perished, um, George of Hanover, the nearest Protestant relative to this deceased queen, took over the country. Now, George of Hanover had a, rem or King George, uh, as he became, uh, had a very hands-off approach to the governance of his nation. He was largely content to allow ministers to rule on his behalf, and this in fact allowed for the beginnings of a kind of evolution that led into the contemporary parliamentary system. So the Georgian period is in fact um, the era in which we laid the foundations for the English political party system. Contrary to the expectations that might have been set by, well, the behaviors of this ruler who adopted a different approach than those of his contemporaries, this era was one of marked stability for the nation. Blake is writing in this period wherein arts and culture flourished in large part because of the stability afforded to him by the, well, the economic situation and the political situation. So what we have from around 1690 to 1744 is the Augustan age in England. During this period, there was an intentional uh, attempt on the parts of authors and writers in the context of this social period to emulate the forms, the structures, and the um, aesthetics of the original Augustan authors or writers who, or artists who were operating in that, well, original Augustan age that the king at this point in England was attempting to emulate. In Augustan Rome, where you had this again, this period of political stability that uh, brought the potential for artistic development to the forefront, you had the rise of exceptional authors like Horace and Virgil. Now, writers in this age, um, at least in the English Augustan age, began to adopt a, a political bent towards their poetry. Their fixation was on a kind of satirical approach to the critique of societal woes and ills, and they framed much of their poetry with the conflict of the individual versus society as the major subject of their verse. This period of artistic explosion in England saw the evolution of various different classical traditional forms that were employed in the original Roman Augustan era and the reformation of their approach and their objectives. So odes, a particular kind of poetry, ceased to be expressions of high praise. Ballads ceased to be narratives and elegies would cease to be sincere memorials. Everything took on the air of satire, of critiquing social issues and the poet becomes figured as an agent of social change. An example of all these tendencies would be Alexander Pope and the Rape of the Lock, and the way in which it advances the satire of the upper classes who fixate on meaningless trivialities to the exclusion of the actual epic romanticism of the original forms of poetry that were meant to extol the virtues of heroes and gods. So in Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock, he takes the form of the epic poem, a form of literature or form of poem that was originally designed to convey the most grandiose and indeed epic presentations of heroism, virtue, and the like, according to the dictates of the social era or the historical era in which these works were produced. He takes this form and he essentially asserts that the people living today are unworthy of the form. Their lives are meaningless, dull, prosaic, don't have the kind of scope, weight, or value that was actually necessary to compose the genre of epic. In this case, the subject of his epic poem is not some great war or conflict as it was in the Iliad. It's not 
Satan and his fall from heaven and his struggle against God or the victory of the Son of God in John Milton's um, Paradise Lost. No, it's about a woman who gets a lock of her hair cut off. So the entire thing is satire. It's meant to undercut and uh, to deride the frivolities and frivolousness of the upper classes in Alexander Pope's era. And we see this turn to the reformulation of classical genres of poetry and literature, and also the, uh, the turn to satire. And now unveiled, writes Pope in The Rape of the Lock, the toilet stands displayed, each silver vase in mystic order laid. First robed in white, the nymph intent adores, with head uncovered, the cosmetic powers. A heavenly image in the glass appears, to that she bends, to that her eyes she rears. The inferior priestess at her altar's side, trembling, begins the sacred rites of pride. Unnumbered treasures oped at once, and here the various offerings of the world appear. From each she nicely culls with curious toil, and decks the goddess with the glittering spoil. This casket India's glowing gems unlocks, and all Arabia breathes from yonder box. The tortoise here and elephant unite, transformed to combs, the speckled and the white. Here files of pins extend their shining rows, puffs, powders, patches, bibles, billadu. Now awful beauty puts on all its arms. So what we have here is a kind of satirical presentation of an arming scene. In the epic poem, oftentimes extensive stanzas were dedicated to the image of the um, the epic hero gathering together all these different weapons and arms, his shield that was forged in the fires of Hades or by Hephaestus himself. So each of the weapons that he uh, assumes, that each aspect of his armor is described in extolling terms, and it's elevated to this mythic scope by describing the way in which it was forged and formed. Here we had the same thing, but it's all of this language, this resplendent, grandiose, hyperbolic language is devoted not to a sword that was forged by the gods or the like, but to the perfumes and powders and puffs that this person uses as she gets ready for the day. The servant who helps her get dressed and helps her to put on her makeup is described as this sacred priestess who is administering sacred rites. All of this is meant to undercut the self-satisfied, smug, and puffed up vision that these people have of themselves when in fact they're only living these, well, flighty and insignificant lives. Now, one of the things we have to understand about the cultural and social movements in this particular period in English history is the division between sense and sensation. What we're doing here is looking at this dialectical division between sense and sensation, these two prevailing attitudes or perspectives in this era of English history, to understand what William Blake is trying to do in some of his most famous poems. In this era, there was a stark division between what they labeled to be sense and what they labeled to be sensation. Sense, or things that were sensible, were all oriented around um, a presentation of, let's say, literature or the purpose of literature that was didactic in nature. Didactic just means that these works had a kind of morally instructive lesson to present. Sense valued and privileged reason and the execution of reason. The works that were produced in, well, this vein were, as a result, focused on the presentation of and were marketed to high culture. And they were defined by a certain sense of refinement. Sensation was the kind of dialectical opposite. So you have, instead of something that is, well, didactic and instructive, titillating, designed to appeal to the senses. As opposed to things that are based on rationality, they sought to inflame and to target the passions. They were also defined by a representation and a reflection on low culture as opposed to high culture. And in the same way, um, the material that they dealt with was oftentimes rough. Now, it's into this environment that William Blake begins to produce some of his most famous works. And we're going to discuss his intentions behind them in just a moment. Many of the poems that you've been assigned to read for today's class derive from either the Songs of Innocence or the Songs of Experience, two paired collections of poems that have essentially parallels between them. So, for instance, in the Songs of Innocence, you have a poem entitled The Lamb. That poem is meant to be a direct parallel to the poem The Tiger in the Songs of Experience. 
These two works present competing perspectives on the world, by, by a perspective of innocence and a perspective of experience. And a kind of conversation develops between the paired poems or the analogues between one set of these poems and the other set. The two works are meant to be put into conversation with each other and to develop by way of the generative unification of contrasts, a new perspective that should emerge out of the conversation between the two works. So the collections of poems themselves are meant to be taken together. Neither perspective is meant to be um, wholly correct. There's always a kind of interplay between the ideas presented in either poem. So you have these collections of different poems that meet up in the middle in order to create a third kind of set of, ex of expectations and perspectives. So Blake hopes to employ a process of dialectic here. Dialectic is the art or practice of arriving at the truth by the exchange of logical arguments. The process especially is associated with Hegel, the philosopher, um, of arriving at the truth by starting at a thesis, developing a contradictory antithesis, and combining and resolving them into a coherent synthesis. A synthesis just means the bringing together of things. So here you have essentially thesis and antithesis in the form of the different poems, the songs of experience and the songs of innocence. Your thesis is stated in one poem, the perspective on the world and the set of values and beliefs conveyed through one poem, let's say the lamb in the songs of experience, are then set against the antithesis in the songs of experience. And when they come together, a new generative contrast evolves out of the conversation. These contrasts could be things like heaven and hell, innocence and experience, white and black, reason and imagination. As we look at the poems that we're studying in this course from the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience, you have a better understanding of this kind of social political climate in which he is operating, where you do have this sense and sensation divide between these large competing forces in society of high art and low art, um, reason and emotion. And you can see how Blake is trying to respond to these competing factors or completing impulses and perspectives by bringing them together in the Songs of Innocence and Experience and trying to expand on them and explore them by putting them into this, well, dialectic process.